morning. morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. My name is Reverend Brian Mercer, and it's so good to be with you here in Minden as we celebrate the Lord, as we celebrate His Holy Sabbath. I was so glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, and that's where we are, and we're going to celebrate Him with song and with word, with prayer, and with sending forth. And so let's gather as God's created and uh, pray before Him as we begin our worship time together. Gracious and holy God, we give you great thanks for the glory of this day. Lord, the opportunity to be in your house, Lord, the opportunity to gather as you're created, called children of the Most High God, co-heirs with Christ. Lord, as we worship you this day, we pray that um, our praise offering would be acceptable in your sight. And Lord, you would be our strength and our redeemer. And so, Lord, fill us and use us this day, Lord, and uh, allow us to hear your word and prepare our hearts to be transformed and our hands and feet to go forth and tell of the good news of Jesus Christ, because he is alive. We give you thanks, Lord, and we begin this worship time in your name. Amen. Let us stand as we sing hymn number 158, Come Christians, join to sing. Let us lift our voices in song as we praise Christ our King.
please join me in the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come to that time in our service where we as a collective body turn our hearts and minds toward God. Uh, so let us take this opportunity to pray as one collective body. God of the ages, you have revealed your grace in our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we wait on your mercies, strengthen us to live in your justice that with open hearts we may hear and accomplish your will. You call us to let go of worry and to trust that you are near. By the power of your Spirit, fill us with your gift of faith so that we may give thanksgiving with a true and upright heart. Lord, we ask with a hospitable spirit, let us welcome the lonely, let us feed the hungry, and let us spread the gospel message for the transformation of the world. And God, as we look into the world, we see so much suffering and pain, especially right now as we look across the world in Afghanistan, Ukraine, and Syria. We just ask, we ask for your mighty hand to bring about a peaceful transformation in these areas of distress. Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ our Lord who is your word that became flesh, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. All of this we pray as we lift up the words that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we begin in our service to listen for God's word, we have a time for children to come down for a children's moment. So our director of children's ministries, uh, Ms. Jamie Moore, is going to come and Hope that all of you children will come and listen to what the Lord has to say to you this day.
Some of our children now go to Children's Church with Miss Jamie. Others will go back and return to their parents and their seats. As we continue to listen for God's word, we're going to now take up the offering, which is a response to God's word and how he calls us to be joyful givers. And so now let's, uh, let's pray over this blessed offering that he's calling us to give. Gracious God, as we give this day, multiply these gifts. Lord, our church is called to be your hands and feet, to feed and to clothe, to invite in and to go out. Lord, may these gifts be a testament to our obedience to you and our desire to be you changing the world for the good. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
church says. Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of John, John 1, 1 through 18. Let us stand in honor of these scriptures. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is, the fa- as, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. And now join us as we sing hymn number 156, I Love to Tell the Story. Please remain standing.
seated. I know I say that all, this often, but that's one of my favorite songs. I love to tell the story. It's so good to be here uh, this morning all together as the body of Christ prepared to hear his word. It's especially great to have my wife back after delivering our third child, Blake, Aaron, who is somewhere in the congregation, I think. Uh, this is baby bingo day at, at First Methodist. And uh, Miss Corlew has him, and Shelly, she's doing a great job back there. So, I love to tell the story. This morning we have a word from uh, the Gospel of John, from Jesus' most beloved disciple, the word tells us. It's John's hope to tell about his best friend, the one that Jesus, uh, the one that he so loved, the one that he followed, the one that he uh, vowed to die for, even though he was one of the few disciples who lived to be into his old age. I wonder if, uh, if I started this morning the message by saying, once upon a time, once upon a time, what would you think I was about to say? What type of story am I about to tell if I say, once upon a time, a fairy tale or a fictional story, right? What about if I say, in the beginning? In the beginning, a statement of purpose, truth, an authentic beginning, and that's how John begins this gospel. The gospel writer, disciple, beloved friend, John. He's residing in Ephesus, we believe. He's making a profound statement in the beginning. In the beginning. You know, if we're not careful, we jump right to the, to the word part of this passage, to the light part of this passage. But John makes a profound statement to you and I, brothers and sisters, and to the people, the Jews and Gentiles in Ephesus, in the beginning. In the beginning. For I believe here in the Gospel of John, this in the beginning says, I want to tell you the whole story of Jesus. The Gospel of John is different from what we call the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They set out to, to write or give an accurate account of Jesus' ministry. But Jesus' best friend this morning for us, he wants to paint a picture. He wants to bear eyewitness to you and I of the fragrance of his friend, if you will, the laughter of his friend, the mightiness, the divinity of his friend, and the humanity of his friend. The Gospel of John sets out to tell the story of Jesus, and he starts by saying, in the beginning. So do you know the song, Lean On Me? Lean on me. Help me out here, please, Lord. Uh, when you're not strong. And I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on for it won't be long till I'm gonna need come on choir somebody to lean on. You know that same uh, songwriter singer sang another pretty famous song. You know which one that one was? I'm not gonna be able to sing it very well, but but ain't no sunshine when she's gone. I'm going to stop there. I'm ahead. I think I did pretty good there. So uh, Bill Withers, Bill Withers, uh, if you're a 1970s child, raise your hand uh, in, the, in the room. I see some hands that were more like 1950s, but I'll let you pass there. Um, so Bill Withers, a great artist, songwriter, singer. You know, we know those songs, and we know them well, don't we? But to tell the story of Bill Withers, to know really about Lean On Me and Ain't No Sunshine When She's Gone, maybe uh, we could start in the beginning. Son of a coal miner in West Virginia. His father died when he was 13. He was one of six children. Like many in those days when they lost a parent, especially a father, he had to go to work to help raise those children. Going back to the beginning helps us to realize how Bill Withers knew a lot about leaning on one another. Amen? About how Bill Withers knew a lot about no sunshine when he's gone. And so John, in that way, wants to give us the full portrait of Jesus. 
And so, such an inadequate way, he says, in the beginning was the Word. When we go back to the beginning, we get the whole picture. We get a deeper understanding of the why, the how, the purpose. John begins this gospel message in such a unique and poetic and and almost hymnic way. A song, it's believed, was his uh, fuel, was that which inspired him to write in this way. A first century song made made up by the early church to sing of the goodness of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. In the beginning was the word. So let's not miss that in the beginning in this passage. Genesis 1, 1, how does it begin? Come on, church. Genesis 1, 1, how does it begin? In the beginning. So John tells us the story or begins the story in a powerful, in a true way. In an intentional way, in a purposeful way to say, in the beginning was the word. Now you have to know this about this word, word. The word, word, meant two different things to those that he was writing to. See, Ephesus was a melting pot of cultures and religions and commerce. Melting pot meaning it was diverse. It was a lot like some of our large cities like New Orleans or or New York City, or San Diego, or San Francisco, or Los Angeles, or Mangum. It was a lot like (laughs) those places that have different parts of their city, German and French, Hispanic, Asian, and all were there in Ephesus. And John writes this word to not only the Jew, but the Gentile. The Gentile, Gentile is a word for non-Jew, by the way. So you have Jews there in Ephesus and you have non-Jews. And John is writing to these Christians who, Jewish Jews who are now Christians and these Gentiles who have converted to Christianity. This letter, this gospel message was written almost at the turn of the first century, 90 to 100 A.D. John was in his oldest of ages. John set out to prove not only the divinity of Christ but the humanity of Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. To the Hebrew, to the Hebrew, the word dabar, D-A-B-R, it just simply means an event or an action. The Hebrew word dabar, an, an event or an action, it was grounded, founded. It was an event that could not be reversed. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the dabar. Why am I telling you this? It's because to the Hebrew, to the Hebrew Christian, the Jew who had converted to Christianity, this word was grounded and founded in what was forever. God spoke and creation occurred, remember? God said, let there be light, and there was light. For the Jew, for the Hebrew, the word, the bar, was forever, infinite, unshakable, purposeful. Irrevocable. Abraham, Abram, heard God's word and he followed. You remember Jacob stole Esau's blessing. You remember that? He put on camel's hair and he went to his son. He even tried to smell like Esau. Isaac gave the birthright blessing to the second son, to Jacob, not Esau. Esau came and begged and said, listen, that was not me. That was Jacob. He tricked us. Could the word be revoked? Could the debar be changed? No. In the beginning was the word. Unchangeable. Unshakable. Irrevocable. To the Jew, John proclaims that the followers of Christ have an unmistakable, irrevocable, irrevocable, unshakable, grounded, founded God here on earth. The word. Remember when a man's word was as good as gold? A handshake was all you needed? Maybe that's still true in your life. I hope it's still true in my life. In the beginning was the word. Now to the Gentile, to the Greek, the 
Gentiles were mostly Greeks, that uh, Hellenistic influence. Go up and look. If you don't know what the word Hellenistic means, it just means that it is this uh, uh, culture of Greek philosophy and thought. John knew that for every one Hebrew in Ephesus, there were 60 Gentile followers of Christ. So he knew that this word would have a double meaning. In the beginning was the word. In the Greek, that word is logos, L-O-G-O-S, which means knowledge or reason. And there in Ephesus, there were all sorts that wanted to know about what, was, what it was to be enlightened, what it was to be all-knowing, what it was to be intelligible. And so they saw great power and great might in knowledge. So John takes on the frame and gate of his best friend Jesus and speaks in their language. He speaks in their language and he speaks in our language so that we know that in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the greatest knowledge of God, the greatest reason of God. Jew and Gentile alike, our Savior is all-creating, all-knowing, all-loving to all. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word was in the beginning. Now, I've been told about a great uh, leader in our church of past, the late John T. Campbell. Did you know John T. Campbell? Anybody in here raise your hand? I did not know him, but his reputation precedes him all the way to Ruston. The first person I heard about whenever I heard that I was coming to Menden was from Mr. Dub Jones, W.A. Jones, who lived with John T. Campbell. He said, oh, Brian, you're going to John T. Campbell's church. One of the great and last country lawyers, is that right? Who had the ability to sit on the front porch and take any type of payment of a farm chicken or a farm animal or some eggs and to sit with country folk alike and was just as comfortable there as he was arguing a case before the Louisiana Supreme Court. Is that right? Is that accurate? In the same way here, John is speaking before two different audiences, writing to two different, very different groups of people, the Jew and the Gentile. Why do I spend so much of this message describing this? Because it's powerful. For us to know that John, the most beloved disciple of Jesus, wants all to know about him. In the beginning was the Word. So you and I can make sure that God, through John, the beloved disciple, God wants all to know of Jesus Christ. The Jew and the Gentile, the Mendonite, the Dubberlyonite, the Spring Hillonite. I better stop there. But he wants all to know. That Jesus Christ is both God and man. John goes on and not only leaves us in that word, the bar or logos, but then he goes to this universal symbol of good, this universal symbol of what is right and holy, light, the word and the light. He beautifully continues his living portrait of Jesus. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. God's first creation was light, remember? Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Genesis 1, 2. Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, Debar. His word was spoken. And let there be light, and there was light. God saw, God saw that the light was good. Jesus, the word and the light of the world. Jesus, the warmth of the world as the light. Jesus, our way, truth, and life. In him there is no darkness at all. Do you know him? Do you lean on him? Is he the light of your world? Is he the foundation of who you are? That's really what this message is all about today. And all that back story in the beginning and the word and the light is all the question to you, do you allow him to rule your life? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is shaking sand. All other ground is shaking sand. When we walk by faith and not by sight, Hebrews 11, who and what lights your way? Jesus. 
Jesus is that answer, the word and the light. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not leave you orphaned. He is coming to you now in this moment. Why should my heart grow weary? You know the song. Why should my heart be sad? His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. There ain't no sunshine when he's gone. You just call on Jesus when you need a hand. We all need somebody to lean on. Bill Barkus promised me he was going to give me an amen through this, and I hadn't heard you yet, Bill Barkus. <laughs> our Father God created the light, and he created our hearts and souls to be what Jamie, our children's minister, described to the children, heliotropic. Did I say that right, English majors? Heliotropic, H-E-L-I-O-T-R-O-P-I-C. It's that part that God not only placed in us, in our souls, but he placed in all plants, especially the sunflowers. Just as a sunflower is heliotropic, it means that its head, a sunflower's head is always facing the sun. In the morning time, it's facing east. In the evening time, it's facing west. Wherever the sun goes, that is where the sunflower head goes. And so our souls, it is as well. Wherever the sun goes, S-O-N, our face, our soul should go. Let us fix our eyes, Hebrews 12 said. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition that you shall not grow weary and not lose heart. All so that we could be the righteousness of God. In the beginning, God created you and me to know, love, and serve Jesus. Do you desire to walk this morning as a child of the light? I'm going to ask that question until I see some nodding heads. Do you desire this morning to walk as a child of the light? Because I want to walk as a child of the light. I want to follow Jesus. In him there is no darkness at all. The night and the day are just alike. The Lamb is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. That's how we're going to close our service this morning. Our hymn of commitment number 206. Now, before you start rustling to get your hymn, hymnals, I just want you to know that this word and this light that John spoke of and wrote of, painted this beautiful picture of his best friend, is not stuck in time. It's not a letter that was just written between 90 and 100 A.D. to the people in Ephesus, but it was a letter, a message, a gospel, the good news that was written for you and for me and for our souls so that we might be warned strangely so that we might have a son to follow so that our souls might be awoke, awakened and our heads might open up I'm thinking about the sunflower now and we might tell of the others I don't know the last time you drove by a sunflower field but, but I can't help but see a sunflower field and just, just smile of course it's because I'm about to go dove hunting but that's neither here nor there but, <laughs> but in smile on the beauty of what God has created so this morning as we sing, I want to walk as a child of the light. Maybe you've never said that before, that you want to walk as a child of the light. Are you tired of following darkness? Are you tired of walking in uncertainty? Are you tired of walking by your own sight and by your own way? If you are, then I invite you to come down and stand beside me. To give your life to Christ, to recommit your life to Christ. <clears throat> Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And the way to the Father is the word and the light. Let's stand together and sing with full voices.
couple of things I want you to know about as we end our time together here. Uh, St. John's Episcopal Church, they're having a fall festival this Saturday. I think that's October the 4th at 5 o'clock. I hope that you'll go and uh, come and support them as we'll uh, be together. And also our fall festival called Pumpkin Shine is October the 26th. It's from 4 to 6. And we're closing down 2nd Street. It's going to be filled with uh, carnival games, great times together as we express what it is to uh, let our light shine. I love the name of our fall festival, Pumpkin Shine. I hope that you will uh, find Kathy Wren one day and tell her how thankful you are and Rachel Miller of all the work they're doing in the evangelism uh, committee. So excited to be with you this morning in the life of the church. If you're a visitor with us, we have a bag of uh, a coffee mug back there for you and uh, would love to learn more about you as you learn more about us in the life of our church. Let's receive this sending forth in benediction. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his presence upon you and give you peace. May all that we have and all that we are, may we give it to Christ and to his service. Amen.